many bad phrases which one associated with the NEP, the new economic policy pursued in the Soviet Union in the 1920s. It was called the end of the proletarian revolution or the collapse of Bolshevism. This period is usually called the era of true democracy in contrast to the supposedly totalitarian Stalin period. In recent times, the capitalist system in modern China is claimed as an analog of the NEP. In this video, we will analyze the true reasons for the emergence of the NEP, its essence, and what results the new economic policy led to. The civil war in Russia between 1918 and 1922 and foreign intervention forced the workers to prioritize the task of defending the new proletarian state. The Soviet government was forced to pursue the so-called military communism policy, which meant the mobilization of all forces and material resources to defend the country. Military communism included such measures as food appropriation, nationalization of all industries, abolition of private trade, obligatory labor duty by non-working classes, rationing of food and most commodities, and centralization of all resources in the hands of the state. In the spring of 1921, in concern with the end of the Civil War, it became clear that it was impossible to continue military communism. The Soviet government was forced to temporarily retreat and build up forces to launch a new offensive against capital. The transition from armed struggle to peaceful life in the Soviet republics took place in a very difficult situation. During the Great and the Civil Wars, the country's economy fell into complete decline. Soviet Russia was in ruins. There was an acute fuel shortage. People lacked bread, meat, clothes, and shoes. In 1920, industrial production accounted for only 14% of pre-war production, and agriculture around 50%. During the period of the struggle against the capitalists and landlords, most of the peasantry put up with Prodras Fyorska the withdrawal of all surplus for food apportionment in cities. However, when the tensest period passed away, they began to express dissatisfaction and demanded that the countryside be supplied with a sufficient amount of goods. The deep economic decline had its effect on the working class, the least stable part of which began to manifest discontent. The counter-revolution tried to take advantage of this by organizing a series of riots with the aim of overthrowing Soviet government. In such a difficult situation, the Soviet government began to make the transition to peaceful life. The priority task of the communists was to revive agriculture, thereby creating the necessary conditions for the rebuilding of industry. The economic situation of Russia in that period was described and analyzed by Lenin in his pamphlet, The Tax in Kind, written in early 1921. He showed that despite the leading role of the socialist system, small-scale production still prevailed in the Soviet economy. During the trade union discussion in 1920 to 1921, the Communist Party outlined a new approach to economic development in peacetime, which was opposed by various internal party factions. Trotsky, who is usually positioned as a supporter of democracy, demanded harsh methods to be implemented. Nationalization and militarization of the trade unions, the so-called workers' opposition, represented by Shlapnikov, Medvedev, and Kolontai, opposed all trade unions to the Soviet system. In contrast to various factions, Lenin pointed out that the trade unions are a school of communism, a worker's school of state and economic management, a mass organization for the education of the working class. The Leninist platform categorically rejected the implementation of military methods to the working environment and pointed out that all work of trade unions should be based on the method of persuasion. Lenin emphasized that the continuation of the policy of military communism under the new conditions would inevitably lead to the death of Soviet power. Party organizations joined the Leninist platform. The outcome of the Civil War showed that the international bourgeoisie was unable to destroy the Soviet Republic. The enemy, many times stronger than the USSR, was forced to abandon the war with the Soviet Union for a long period. Meanwhile, the course of the world's revolution in the capitalist countries slowed down, which meant that the underdeveloped and ruined Soviet Republic had to restore its economy and build a socialist society on its own. The transition to a new economic policy was the only way to solve the problems of the victorious working class in the Soviet Union. Reviving the economy was the main priority of the first period of this policy. The task was to revive agriculture in the country. The workers' government took a number of decisive actions. Firstly, it regulated taxes, land use, and lease rules 
to encourage small farms and prevent the kulaks, rural exploiters, from exploiting the poorest peasants. Secondly, the Soviet government regulated the price of goods, provided credit and insurance, helped with the peasants' cooperation, and also stimulated the creation of artels, communes, and state-owned farms, the basis of socialist agriculture. Thirdly, widespread agricultural propaganda was launched, whose goal was to increase the productivity of peasant farms and put forward the collectivization process. The 10th Congress of the Communist Party, gathered in March 1921, adopted Lenin's plan for the introduction of the tax in kind to replace Prodrozvyorska. The tax in kind significantly eased the conditions of the peasants, and because it was much less than the previous apportionment, the peasants could use the produce surpluses in exchange for industrial goods. The replacement of food apportionment by the tax in kind stimulated the growth of both the peasantry and industry. Personal interest was encouraged, and conditions were created for raising labor productivity and further boosting agriculture. In addition, the size of the tax in kind depended on the class position. The Kulak farms were taxed more strongly, while the poor peasants were completely exempt from the tax in kind. The 10th Congress of the party also adopted a decision on the admissibility of exchange within the local economic turnover through cooperative organizations and market trade. It was assumed that the exchange of goods would become a weapon in the fight against speculation and limit the intermediation of private capital between socialist industry and the peasants. The state transferred a special commodity fund to the cooperatives for the exchange for bread, but it was not possible to limit themselves to the development of only local turnover and to stay within the framework of the exchange of goods. In the fall of 1921, large fairs began to revive and trade exchanges were opened. The tax in kind for the years 1921 to 1922 was set at 3,931,200 tons of grain against almost 7 million tons, which were to be collected in 1920 to 1921 by food apportionment. The decree of May 24, 1921 established that the right to exchange, purchase, and sale also applies to products and objects of the handicraft and small industry. As for the products manufactured by state-owned enterprises, they had to go not to the market, but to the state's commodity exchange fund. The experience of the summer of 1921 showed that it was necessary to go further along the path of expanding trade. As Lenin said, this system of commodity exchange is broken down it has broken down in the sense that it has assumed the form of buying and selling. There was a need to switch from local turnover to free trade under state regulation. The boundaries previously set for trade were expanding. Freedom of trade meant for the first time some revival of capitalism in the country, but the proletarian state maintained the control of the national economy. Lenin said that the freedom of trade inevitably gives rise to capitalist elements. The question arose, can freedom of trade be restored and the development of capitalism allowed without undermining the foundations of the political rule of the working class. Lenin replied, yes it can, for everything hinges on the extent. If we are able to maintain even a small quantity of goods and hold them in the hands of the state, the proletariat exercising political power, and if we could release these goods into circulation, we, as the state, would add economic power to our political power. Trading became the main link to master the entire chain. Lenin pointed out that without solving this problem, the socialist foundation cannot be created. Communism and trade? It sounds strange. The two seem to be unconnected, incongruous, pulls apart. But if we study it from the point of view of economics, we shall find that the one is no more remote from the other than communism is from small peasant, patriarchal farming. Trade was the only possible form of economic connection between small-scale peasant farming and large-scale industry. Enemies of the communists and Soviet power considered the NEP and trade as a concession to capitalism. In fact, the introduction of free trade was a concession, but only to the peasantry, and it was made in order to establish and strengthen the economic bond between the working class and the peasantry. Lenin believed that a certain revival of capitalism is not terrible for the proletarian state, since the working class holds in its hands the land, large-scale industry, railways, water transport, banks, and other sectors of the national economy. 
In the outline of his speech at the 4th Congress of the Comintern, Lenin wrote, What is the plan, or idea, or essence of the NEP? 1. Preserving the land in the hands of the state. 2. Also preserve all the management in the means of production, transport, etc. 3. Freedom of trade and small-scale production. 4. State capitalism, i.e. attracting private capital and concessions and mixed companies. In this regard, Lenin's cooperative plan arises, which is the most important component of the new economic policy. According to Lenin's plan, under the dictatorship of the proletariat, the involvement of the peasants in socialist construction should go through cooperation by gradually introducing the principles of collectivism into agriculture, firstly by marketing, and then in the production of agricultural products. Lenin viewed cooperation as a way to unite millions of the population, and then the entire population, in the struggle for socialism. However, cooperation itself does not yet mean socialism. In a capitalist society, cooperatives are forced to operate in a market trade economy under the dominance of capitalists, and it's impossible to destroy capitalism only by uniting in cooperatives. Cooperation under the dictatorship of the proletariat, as Lenin put it, is very close to socialism. And given social ownership and the means of production, given the class victory of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie, the system of civilized cooperators is the system of socialism. Lenin paid a lot of attention to heavy industry. He viewed it as the main foundation of socialism, ensuring the technical re-equipment of industry and other sectors of the national economy. The limited fuel, raw materials, and food forced the proletarian state to lease out some of the small enterprises, which Lenin regarded as one of the forms of state capitalism allowed under the NEP. As of January 1st, 1923, a total of 4,330 manufacturing enterprises were leased, which amounted to 10% of all nationalized enterprises. This number includes enterprises leased not only to private individuals, but also to cooperatives and other organizations. The most typical form of state capitalist enterprises allowed under the NEP was concessions. By transferring enterprises to concessions, the Communist Party pursued a double goal. On the one hand, according to Lenin, it was distracting imperialists from us, and on the other, it stimulated those industries that the Soviet Republic could not develop independently. We admit quite openly, and do not conceal the fact, that concessions in the system of state capitalism mean paying tribute to capitalism, but we gain time, and gaining time means gaining everything. Concessions did not always mean the transfer of production into the hands of the capitalists. In 1922, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America and the Soviet government created the Russian American Industrial Corporation, RAIC, to which a number of textile and garment factories in Petrograd and Moscow were transferred. RAIC raised $2 million, which was spent on launching or upgrading 34 industrial facilities, employing 17,500 workers. All in all, from 1921 to 1926, Soviet power received approximately 2,000 proposals for the conclusion of concessions from foreign capitalists, but only 135 contracts were signed. The role of private capital in industry from the very beginning of the NEP was extremely insignificant. From 1925 to 1926, in the licensed industry, it was only 4% of the total gross output, and 2.6% of the average number of workers in the entire industry. In 1925, 92 foreign concessions operated in the USSR, of which 43 were in industry. All concession enterprises employed 54,000 workers. The share of all private industry, including non-licensed, small, and handicraft, reached about 24% between 1924 to 1925. But a significant part of this small industry were handicraftsmen and artisans who did not employ hired labor. It is very important in understanding the essence of Soviet concessions that the workers' rights in concession enterprises were guaranteed and protected by the dictatorship of the proletariat that reigned in the country. The transition to NEP also required a new organization of state industry, trusts, and syndicates were created. By the beginning of 1923, there were 172 trusts directly subordinate to the Supreme Council of the National Economy and 258 local trusts. The 17 syndicates that existed by that time concentrated the trading activities of 170 trusts and 48 trusted enterprises under the leadership of the Communist Party. 
In a fierce struggle against all the restorers of capitalism, socialist industry was quickly growing with the help of the NEP. In 1921, during the transition to the NEP, the gross output of the licensed industry was only 13.8% of the pre-war level. In 1922, it reached 19.5%. In 1923, 39.1%. In 1924, 45.5%. And in 1925, 75.8%. For three years, from October 1923 to October 1926, the share of the state cooperative sector in the total trade turnover increased from 44 to 76%, and the capitalist sector decreased from 41% to 19%. The socialist sector and industry in 1925 accounted for 73.3%, in wholesale trade, 87.9%, and in retail trade, 55.9%. By 1927, the share of the socialist sector and industry reached 86%, while the share of private traders in retail trade fell to 35%, and in wholesale to 5%. The annual increase in the production of Soviet industry during the recovery period of the NEP was 41.1% in 1921, 30.7% in 1922, 22.9% in 1923, 14.4% in 1924, and 66.1% in 1925. The task of reviving industry and economic mastery of the market set by Lenin was fulfilled. If you want to understand the essence of the new economic policy, you must understand its dual nature. On the one hand, it meant a certain freedom of trade. On the other hand, this freedom of trade existed only within limits while ensuring the regulatory role of the worker's state in the market. On the one hand, the NEP allowed the revival of the capitalist elements. On the other hand, it was calculated for the victory of the socialist elements over the capitalist ones, for building the foundation of the socialist economy and the abolition of classes. A two-sided process of the simultaneous development of capitalism and socialism took place, between which there was an acute struggle. The capitalist elements were overcome by the socialists. The contradictory nature of the NEP led to the fact that unemployment persisted in the socialist state. Crises occurred regularly. A stratum of the rich, so-called netmen, arose. The need to manage a huge economic complex led to the inevitable growth of the state apparatus. The very transition to net from military communism was interpreted as a step back and seemed unexpected, which was reflected in the growth of decadent sentiments in society. Oppositionists in the party such as Trotsky and Zinoviev, focused exclusively on the shortcomings of the NEP. They drew the conclusion about the beginning of the degeneration of Soviet power, the slide of the USSR to capitalism, and the death of the revolution. Their way of solving problems consisted in ultra-left calls for an offensive on the countryside and the subordination of the peasants to the workers, which would undermine the authority of the workers' power and destroy the bond that took so long to create. In turn, the Bolsheviks emphasized the need for daily and routine economic work, which is as important as successes on the war fronts. The Bolshevik party not only theoretically exposed the entire falsity of the oppositional interpretations of the NEP, but also proved in practice the correctness of the Leninist path. The strengthening of the economic bond between the working class and the peasantry dealt a crushing blow to the Kulak's attempt to lead the bulk of the peasantry. The introduction of the NEP raised the question of who will win in economic construction, socialism or capitalism. At the same time, the proletarian state kept its essence and was able to strengthen the political and economic power of the working class. Thus, we can say with confidence that the new economic policy has fully justified itself, keeping in its hands large-scale industry, transport, banks, land, domestic and foreign trade, the Soviet government significantly strengthened its positions. The living conditions of the working class improved. The monetary reform carried out in 1924 introduced hard currency instead of devalued paper money and strengthened the financial position of the Soviet state. The revival of state trade and cooperation increased the proportion of socialist forms of economy. Soviet trade began to oust the private trader. The peasant economy to which the Soviet government provided substantial support, 
also noticeably strengthened. The essence of this policy was clearly explained by Joseph Stalin. NEP is a special policy of the proletarian state aimed at permitting capitalism while the commanding positions are held by the proletarian state, aimed at a struggle between the capitalist and socialist elements, aimed at increasing the role of the socialist elements to the detriment of the capitalist elements, aimed at the victory of the socialist elements over the capitalist elements, aimed at the abolition of classes and the building of the foundations of a socialist economy. Stalin's definition thoroughly and completely withstood the historical test. Unlike modern China, where capital reigns everywhere and has infiltrated the governing bodies and the Communist Party, turning China into an imperialist state with severe social inequality and the power of oligarchs, the Soviet Union was able to avoid such mistakes, keeping the capitalist elements under the control of the workers, and then launch a victorious attack on capitalism. Not only did the new economic policy not lead to the restoration of capitalism, but it also managed to facilitate the building of socialism, becoming an example of the correct tactics of the communists in the new conditions. Stay tuned.